So, hello everyone and welcome to the meeting of our analytic philosophy circle. Our analytic philosophy circle started in 2006 and we hardly try to keep a tough schedule and meet every week. Uh, but of course, it it is not so simple, it doesn't work uh, as it expected. At these uh, sessions, we discuss both uh, classical and cutting edge works in analytic philosophy, logic and foundations of mathematics. Also, we organize an annual conference, UAnalyticon, and publish the sole journal of analytic philosophy in Russia, which is entitled Analytica. So let me introduce our participants, the participants of today's discussion. Uh, Victoria Sukhareva, Olga Kozreva, and me, Lev Lamberov from Ural Federal University, uh, Grigory Cherkasa from Moscow State University, Anna Moiseeva from High School of Economics in Moscow, and Mikhail Patrikeev, Institute of Mathematics and Mechanics, a Ural branch of Russian Academy of Sciences. And finally, let me introduce our speaker, Leon Horsten, professor for, philosophy, for theoretical philosophy with special emphasis on metaphysics, epistemology, and logic, Fachbereich uh, Philosophy, University at Constance. So, Leon, please. Okay, so first of all, um, thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk in your um, um, uh, in your research seminar, I very much appreciate, uh, uh, very much appreciate it. And then um, secondly, so I'm going to talk about um, um, reflection in the mathematical sciences. So I will share my screen in, um, in a few, in a minute or so. And um, that will mean that I cannot see um, your faces anymore. So if you at some point don't understand something or um, uh, uh, want to comment, feel free to interrupt me at any time and then just say something. Then I will, I will stop and listen and try to answer what you're saying, but I won't be able to see it if you raise your hand, probably. Um, um, Okay, so that's the first thing, the practical thing. Secondly, I cannot, of course, um, start this talk without saying anything um, about, you know, the unfortunate, the 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 the, the, um, the very sad conflict in uh, between Russia and Ukraine. I want to just express my profound sa sadness about the whole conflict and the immense loss of life. And for me also, but many of my colleagues here also, um, the loss of contacts with um, people in Russia, the loss of contact with friends, and also the loss just of contact with um, what I feel to be um, a part of Europe. That's, that's just very, very painful somehow. So I really hope that um, this uh, war will be stopped at some time very soon. And this can only happen if um, if both sides uh, start to talk to each other and talking to each other requires also listening to each other from both sides. And um, well, of course, I cannot speak for the Russian side of this, but I do do recognize that um, um, on the Western side, even before the conflict, there was just not an, a sufficient attempt to understand um, the Russian concerns and the Russian position. <clears throat> but on the other other side, I think um, probably on the Russian side, there's also some um, work in understanding position, for instance, of former Eastern Bloc countries to be done. So I really hope that um, we will start listening to each other. Um, and that requires talking to each other. And that means that um, the channels of communication should not be as closed as they are now. I mean, this is what happened in uh, here in Germany um, immediately after the conflict broke down, broke out. Um, the conflict, the, the channels of communication uh, were 
were closed down. So uh, collaboration with my friends in Russia, scientific collaboration was not allowed to me anymore. And um, well, um, I think um, I think this is not a good situation. I think uh, I think it is now time to uh, start talking. I mean, we should have done this much earlier, but it becomes more urgent every day. So that's all all I wanted to say as a preface to this, but I, um, I'm sure you've heard all of this before. Um, I'll just start with my talk now, and that means sharing my screen. <clears throat> um, okay, so let's see. Mm -hmm. um, can you see the, t the whole slides right now, or only part of it? Part of it, probably, yeah? Yes, part of it. Okay, good. And then if I do this, and if I then uh, full screen, now I hope um, you see the, the slides. Yes. Okay, good. Then I will, I will just start my talk. So it's going to be about uh, on reflection in the mathematical sciences. Okay, let's see what time it is now. Okay. Um, so it's going to be about the concept of reflection, which is um, a, a term that has not really received much systematic attention in um, contemporary analytical uh, philosophy. And there are reasons for this. One reason is that the general concept of reflection, of course, it is a philosophical concept, but it's just somehow a little bit too general to be a um, useful uh, thing to theorize about in analytical philosophy, because in its most general sense, um, reflecting on something means uh, philosophically thinking about something. So if you want to have a theory about reflection, then that seems to be requiring a theory of um, philosophical thinking. And that is just too general to be very useful to theorize about. But there are also um, more specific concepts of reflection. And um, uh, I think it's that's one of my claims that it is fruitful to think about um, uh, um, these more specific concepts of reflection. It's a little bit like the concept of symmetry. It, there is a very vague, general, generic sense of concept of, of symmetry. You cannot really have a good a deep theory of symmetry totally in general, but specific concepts of, of symmetry, uh, for instance, um, symmetry considerations in physics, well, you can certainly say um, a great deal about it. Uh, theoretically, that is very useful. So the same holds for reflection. That's what I um, um, claim. And I will talk about reflection in the mathematical sciences and with the mathematical sciences, I have primarily proof theory, set theory and probability theory in mind. So that's the idea. <clears throat> um, well, if we, um, if, we ref if we think a little bit about the context in which this is taking place, then if we go back to Frege's three realms, the material realm, the mental realm and the abstract realm, then we will not be concerned with reflection in the mental, in the material realm. Of course, there is reflection in the material realm. Um, and that, for instance, that is um, one uh, theme in um, uh, a discipline, in a subdiscipline of physics, namely optics. Uh, how um, light rays are reflected, for instance, and what it means for an image to be reflected, and so on. But I will not be concerned with that at all, even though there are philosophical things, interesting philosophical things to say about that. I will not be concerned with that. Now, mathematics is, in, is at least at face value, um, uh, concerned with abstract objects. For instance, numbers are abstract objects, sets are abstract objects. And that means that um, um, we will be concerned with the abstract world to some extent. But we will also see that um, reflection um, um, principles in uh, reflection in the mathematical sciences, especially in proof theory, also are somehow connected, at least uh, from a philosophical perspective, with the mental world. So we will be um, somewhat concerned with aspects of the mental world and somewhat concerned with 
aspects of the abstract world. <clears throat> okay, so there are two kinds of reflection that I will be concerned with. The one, one I call epistemic reflection, and that is will be um, um, related to certain principles that are investigated in proof theory. And the second is ontological reflection, which will be concerned, which was primarily, which is concerned, which is related to um, reflection principles in set theory, to on the one hand, um, well, ma mainly with reflection principles in set theory. Um, okay, so that's that's what we will, that's what I'm going to talk about, and um, my. Uh, here I wrote that my emphasis will be on ontological reflection, but that is not quite um, true. I will, I will talk both about epistemic reflection and on ontological reflection. And as I said, if at some point something is not clear, just interrupt me and, and, um, and, and ask your question or give your comment. <clears throat> okay, so what am I going to talk about? Well, I mean, um, I'm going to look at the history of epistemic reflection and the history of ontological reflection. And I will argue that it has a long history um, that is not, at present not very well un understood. So I think there's a lot of work in history of philosophy to be done um, about the history of reflection. Um, yeah, so it has a long history, not just in uh, philosophy actually, but also in theology. And I will say a little bit about that, but not much. Okay, uh, that's the first thing. So my talk has a historical part. Secondly, it has a systematic part. I want to um, try to explicate what ontological reflection and epistemic reflection consists in. At least I want to uh, uh, um, 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 explicate this in part, take first steps in that direction. And then to conclude, um, I also want to um, say something about what uh, what are what possible directions are for research on uh, reflection epistemic reflection and ontological reflection in the mathematical sciences in the future and also what philosophical problems um, we might uh, want to think about more deeply in uh, the years and maybe decades to come <clears throat> so the nature of the talk is going to be as follows it's going to be kind of a big picture talk um, so the, uh, the uh, technical details uh, will often be uh, suppressed a bit, although we can talk about them in the, in the, um, in the discussion. I will presume some, um, a little bit of basic understanding of what proof theory is concerned with, what set theory is concerned with, and what probability uh, theory is concerned with, but only elementary things. And yeah, it's going to be basically mostly a philosophical talk, but it relates to, to very technical things as well. But the emphasis will be on philosophy. <clears throat> okay, so we've now, I've now more or less covered the introduction to this talk. The second, and, and I will now start talking about the history of reflection a bit. And then um, I'm going to systematically uh, look at epistemic reflection principles and ontological reflection principles. I'm going to state what these things are, these things in the mathematical sciences, and I'm going to discuss what kind of philosophical problems or philosophical questions they raise. So what kind of tasks for the philosophy of mathematics follow from that. And then, yeah, in the end, um, I will conclude with a few open problems. I could list a lot more open problems than I do here, but I've just picked some that I think are, are kind of, yeah, important. So I hope that's clear so far. That was just the introduction so far. Okay, so epistemic uh, reflection. Well, what one has to, what one should kind of keep in mind here is what we know from um, uh, from general philosophy and from history of philosophy. So when Locke talked about uh, reflection uh, as thinking about one, the contents of one's own mind, more or less, that's, the, that's epistemic reflection as we know it, because that's the concept of reflection that um, has really, um, that, re that is really at the, at the 
basis of our uh, current understanding of reflection in epistemology, which is connected with called introspection principles. Uh, what is um, um, intros in, uh, and, and the processes of introspection, uh, thinking about the context of one's own mind. There's a lot of literature about this, a lot of research about this, but it has a history and it has a long history. So it, it goes back at least to Aristotle, possibly further that I do not know. But I w wanted to say something about um, uh, um, this important um, locus in Aristotle's philosophy, because it's kind of, it, it, um, I think it's important to understand what this, uh, what, what, what it is about. So it's, um, there, it's, um, I think the, the, the place where Aristotle kind of introduces this idea of self-reflection in Greek philosophy um, is in um, his commentary on Plato's cosmology in De Anima. So, um, yeah, so this is history of philosophy. Um, Plato thought that uh, the material world is a, is a perfect sphere, is, is a sphere, a material sphere. Okay. And um, he wanted to explain how, um, why it is that um, the, um, the stars revolve around the earth. So the idea was the earth is in the center and it doesn't move, but the heavens move revolve around the earth and why is that well in order to explain that in his cosmology he introduced the idea of the world soul so he thought that there was a, a soul of the universe that is coextensive with the whole material universe so it permeates this whole material sphere and moreover he um, postulates or he says that this world soul revolves so it turns into itself somehow, it, it revolves. And um, by revolving, this world soul kind of drags the fixed stars along in, um, in their orbit around uh, the, the Earth. That was the idea. So that's why the stars move uh, for uh, Plato. And Aristotle was not uh, satisfied with this. He said, well, this is... Um, conceiving of something which is mental, the world soul, in, 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 a, in a too physical way, in a, too in a way that is too mechanical, too physical. Um, and he says, well, if we want to understand this world soul and how it has these causal powers, because he did agree with um, Plato that uh, the world soul has causal powers, and of course, this is a very natural primitive idea that um, thinking has causal powers. He thought, well, we have to analyze um, what this, uh, we have to analyze this world soul. And what does this world soul do? It thinks. It does nothing but thinking. That's what Aristotle says. <clears throat> and um, thinking is a material, is a mental activity. So there already we, we move away from this physical way of understanding the world soul, where it moves, where it revolves in uh, Plato's um, view. Aristotle, uh, Aristotle says, no, it doesn't revolve, it just thinks. Now, he says there are two kinds of thinking. There is imperfect thinking, and that is the kind of thinking that we usually do. This is 99.9% .9 of the thinking that is done is in, the, in the world is, uh, is imperfect thinking. And that is thinking where the, um, the, the thought does not coincide with the object of thought. So, you, so there's some sort of distance between the thinking and what you're thinking about. And that means you can kind of draw a line between the a line segment between thought, the thought and the object of thought. They do not co coincide. That, and he calls this rectilinear thinking or thinking in a straight line or something like that. And he says, this is not very good quality thinking because the object of thought does not coincide with the thought itself. And that means that the, the thought is, can never be totally adequate to what it's thinking about. There's also always a gap. So this is very imperfect, uh, inadequate thought, and at least somewhat inadequate in all cases.
Okay, so that's a problem because that's what we usually do. We think about a tree outside our window and the tree does not coincide with our thoughts. So we have this rectilinear thinking. Nonetheless, Aristotle says, there is also a perfect form of thinking which does not have this problem that the object of thought does not coincide with the thought. And that is when, you're think when an entity is thinking about itself, then that, um, the, 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 uh, there's no distance between the thinking um, entity, the thought and the object of thought. Um, and that means that um, this thought is totally adequate uh, and he calls this circular thinking so the, the the mind goes out of itself and returns to itself circular thinking so circular thinking in this sense is perfect thinking and that's what this world soul does it doesn't move it doesn't revolve but it thinks itself continuously and through thinking itself it has these ca causal powers of moving the heavens and so on so perfect thought is self-thought. That's the outcome of all of this. And, um, and this um, idea has had then a long history. So for instance, it, it, in the Middle Ages, we see with Avicenna, his theory of the flying man that I'm not going to go into now, where in some sense, this, this idea of um, perfect thought as self-thought is is brought down from the absolute um, world cosmos uh, uh, or world soul to uh, sort of down to earth, uh, namely the, the where you have human beings or idealized human beings, subjects that are kind of um, uh, thinking themselves. And that then, you know, if we go a little bit further, then we have Descartes' cogito, there it's again not the world soul that thinks itself, but it is the human subject that thinks itself. But Descartes agreed with Aristotle that this is very high quality thought. This is, this is, um, this is um, thought that you can build a whole metaphysical system on. Whereas on rectilinear thought, you cannot build, build a whole universal metaphysical system on, in Descartes' view. And then a little bit later, we get the uh, British empiricist um, um, Locke, for instance, who talks about um, introspection as knowledge of the operation and contents of one's own mind. And then we're actually pretty close to a contemporary understanding of um, epistemic reflection. But still, even in contemporary discussions in philosophy of mind, um, 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 this epistemic reflexive thoughts um, are taken to be of exceptional quality often. For instance, there's a lot of discussion in philosophy of mind about a privileged first person access in the sense that we have privileged access to the contents of our own ideas. We have better access to it ourselves than other people have to it. And um, um, yeah, and that and that is of course a faint echo of this idea of Aristotle that uh, that self thought is kind of perfect thought. <clears throat> okay, so that's that's the history of um, of epistemic reflection in a nutshell. Of course, a lot to be said here, and I think there is a lot that is not known about this history. A lot of work to be done. Now ontological reflection so um, that's the second kind of reflection that I think also has a long history which is even um, less well understood but a very important figure there in Greek philosophy is Philo of Alexandria first century AD so contemporary of Christ he was he was um, not just a philosoph philosoph uh, philosopher but he was actually more I would say primarily a theologian, a Jewish theologian. He was not a Christian at all. He didn't know of the existence of Christ. He was a Jewish theologian. But the way, so he commented on the Old Testament. He was an Old Testament commentator. And he did this in very abstract terms that people then in later generations try to understand. And they said, well, when he is talking, for instance, about the Logos, the word of God, He's really talking about Christ, which is, you know, historically incorrect because he didn't know of the existence of Christ and Christians. But um, 
but that's the reason why his works were copied and why we still know about them. Now, this, um, um, I'm, so Philo of Alexandria does this Old Testament um, commentating, and I'm going to read one passage uh, where he comments on Moses who sees God in the burning bush. It's an Old Testament passage, a very famous one. And he wants to find the metaphysical or theological meaning of that and how, how we should understand it. And he says the following. So this is in his book on dreams that he writes this. He says, thus in another place, when he, and he with small letters is Moses, when Moses had inquired whether he that is, God, has a proper name, he came to know full well that God has no proper name, and here he refers to Exodus 6.3, and that whatever name anyone may use for him, for God, he will use by license of language. For it is not in the nature of him that is to be spoken of, but simply to be. To the souls indeed, which are incorporeal and occupied in his worship, he's talking about the angels here, it is likely that God should reveal himself as he is, conversing with him as a friend with friends. So God talks the, to the angels as a friend with friends. But to souls which are still in the body, he gives himself the likeness of angels. Souls who are still in the body, which are still in the body, that's us, that's the humans. To the humans, he gives himself the likeness of angels. He pre presents himself as an angel. Not altering his own nature, for he is unchangeable, but conveying to those who receive the impression of his presence a semblance in a different form, such that they take the image not to be a copy, but that original form itself. So that means this angel form in which he presents himself cannot be distinguished by us from um, the true from the true one and only God. That's the idea here. So let's do a little bit of interpretation. <clears throat> God wants to talk to us. Um, he wants to communicate with us, but he cannot directly communicate with us because of his transcendence. God is not of this world, so there can be no direct content and contact. And this is this is often expressed by saying, I mean, in, in theology, by saying that if God were to, if we would hear um, one word directly from God, then we could not survive this. This would be too big for us to survive. Yeah? So it would blow, blow our mind. So we cannot directly communicate with us. Um, okay. And therefore he creates an angel. So he, God has a solution for this problem which which he has, is faced, and that is to create an angel. Angels belong to this world. God does not belong to this world. Angels belong to, the, to our world, although they are um, much more perfect and so on and so forth, immaterial, but they belong to the created world. And they can communicate with us and be perceived by us. Um, so, um, when God, when Moses sees God in the burning bush, he really sees an angel. But God creates this angel in such a way that this, that we can not, we, it's impossible for us to, ex, to distinguish this angel from God himself. That's why God, Moses thinks that he's seeing God in the burning bush. But this angel can then tell us things. And um, since um, there is this indistinguishability relation between the angel and, and God. This angel can convey us information about God, what God wants to communicate. Well, uh, he, he, we, we can in this way obtain knowledge about God, <clears throat> not directly from God, because he cannot directly talk to us. We get it from this angel, but we get knowledge about God in the end. So that's the idea of um, ontological reflection. So God is reflected in angels. That's basically the idea. Um, and, and all the key ingredients from, for, of the, notions, uh, the notion of reflection, which plays a role in set theory, are present in this thought by Philo of Alexandria. Now, this, this, uh, this view of Philo of Alexandria, which was heterodox in the Jewish circles, to which he belonged and which is also 
not considered very um, orthodox in the later Christian communities because of the tension with monotheism. It was still, it was not, it was never forgotten, but it was also never, well, it was, it was certainly in the later Middle Ages, from the later Middle Ages onwards, not very central anymore and kind of forgotten later to some extent. But there are strong echoes of this, for instance, in Leibniz's theory of monads and so on that I won't talk about now. Okay, good. So that's um, um, the history of um, ontological reflection. Ontological reflection is not, I think, really a theme in um, much of a theme in contemporary metaphysics, I, I should say, anymore, not anymore. Okay, so what's the relation with the mathematical sciences? So now I come to the next part. <clears throat> um, because so far this was just history of philosophy and theology. What does this have to do with the mathematical sciences? In particular, proof theory, set theory, and um, uh, probability theory. Well, let's start with proof theory. I claim that proof theory is related to epistemic reflection. So, so in some sense, that introspection uh, plays a role somehow, is connected to these, uh, to, to these principles, uh, to, uh, to proof theoretic reflection principles. Okay, so what are these proof theoretic reflection principles that have some sort of connection with epistemic reflection? Well, um, there are many um, proof theoretic reflection principles, many reflection principles that are studied very intensively in proof theory. I'm just going to focus on four main ones. So first of all, there are the consistency statements. Suppose you have a theory, a mathematical theory, S. Let it be, for instance, piano arithmetic, first order arithmetic, the standard axioms. Then you can arithmetically express the consistency of S. You can say, well, um, um, S does not prove that zero equals one. And proving in uh, a, the notion of a proof in S can be arithmetically coded. Gödel worked this out. So since the early 1930s, we know how this works. Um, and then there is local reflection, um, which is a somewhat stronger principle. Also, it's relative to a formal system S, and it is a schematic principle. It's a schematic principle for closed formulas, formulas with no free variables. Uh, phi. So let's say for all arithmetic, for every arithmetical sentence phi, we can postulate that if phi is provable in S, then phi. Well, then we've expressed local reflection. And we can already see that um, consistency is kind of a very weak form of local reflection, because if we replace phi, instantiate phi by the simple formula zero equals one, then we get consistency. So consistency is a special case. Okay, that's local reflection. And then uh, we have uniform reflection, um, which is like local reflection. So it's a scheme, but it's a scheme not for closed formulas, but now we also allow uh, formulas with free variables, which are then taken to be universally quantified over. That's called uniform reflection. So for instance, um, if we say for every x, if it is provable in Peano arithmetic that x uh, that, that phi holds of x, then phi holds of x. Well, then um, we have expressed um, uniform reflection for Peano arithmetic. And the last reflection principle is called global reflection. And that uses a new non-arithmetical predicate, t. Yeah, so you extend the language of arithmetic with a new predicate, t, t of x. And then you say for every x, if x is provable in s, let's say beyond arithmetic, then s is true. That is global reflection. And global reflection is stronger as un than uniform reflection is stronger than local reflection is stronger than um, consistency. So that's, this is kind of a hierarchy of proof theoretic reflection principles here that many of you will know, but I was just I just wanted to 
to write them down to, uh, to, for those who may not be familiar with them. <clears throat> now, these are investigated very intensively in proof theory. There are deep connections, for instance, between um, reflection principles and induction principles. They are always relative to a formal theory because S was a parameter in these principles and they are iterable. So you can start from a theory, a Peano arithmetic, add a reflection principle to it, for instance, the consistency of arithmetic, then you get a new formal system, PA plus the consistency of PA. But then you can, uh, um, uh, then you can form the consistency statements for that, for that new system, consistency of piano arithmetic plus consistency of piano arithmetic, and add that, and so on and so forth. And you can even carry this out into the transfinite um, and, and, and study these kind of progressions of formal theories as they, um, as they are called. And um, yeah, so uh, seminal figures or um, I think the, the classical, uh, the person who, who, who was mostly associated with the formal investigation of these kind of principles and their iterations is Solomon Pfefferman, who died about five years ago, I think now, um, in the 1960s. But um, even in the recent times, um, um, important work has been done there. For instance, Lev Beklemyshev from Moscow, um, um, uh, did very important work in this area. <clears throat> now, so they're not only iterable, but they're also independent. So that we know this from Gödel's incompleteness theorems, already the consistency of piano arithmetic is independent of piano arithmetic. So if you add it to piano arithmetic, then you reduce the incompleteness of piano arithmetic. And if you iterate this process, you, you reduce the incompleteness of, of arithmetic ever further. Of course, we know from the incompleteness theorems that we can never fully re, uh, reduce, uh, we can never fully eliminate uh, incompleteness in arithmetic, at least not in a recursive, co recursive context. Now, this global reflection principle is a bit special because it, it uses this truth predicate. Huh? If you remember, it says if, if um, X is provable, then it's true. Okay. But we know by Tarski's theorem on the undefinability of truth that truth is not itself arithmetically definable, unlike, for instance, provability in a formal theory. Um, that makes it kind of special in, these proof, in, these, uh, in this hierarchy of proof theoretic reflection principles. Now, consistency, local reflection, global reflection are only ideologically productive. They produce new theorems, but not new mathematical entities. But in some sense, global reflection is already ontologically productive because using a truth predicate, a formula can be seen as an object, right? So by a coding. So if you have a, <clears throat> if you have a formula phi of x, then that defines a class, but you cannot normally refer to that class directly. But you can, but if, so if you have this formula f of x, f is a, a complex predicate, um, then it defines a class, but using the truth predicate, you can refer to this class. It's true that f of x, hmm? then, um, the, the, well, uh, the Gödel code of, uh, of f, f of x, then you're really treating this predicate as an object itself, so as a surrogate of classes. So in some sense, um, global reflection is, is, is again a bit different from these um, other more standard proof theoretic reflection principles. Okay, good. Now, um, as philosophers of mathematics, we're interested in the question, um, um, what is our epistemic warrant for believing that these proof theoretic reflection principles are true? Because they are independent, typically. Of course, if you start with an inconsistent system, then they're not independent, clearly. But if you start with a consistent system, then um, adding uh, a reflection principle to it of the kinds that I've just discussed um, result. If you, uh, if you start with a sound system, a system which is true, for instance, piano arithmetic, and add a reflection principle for it, well, then the resulting theory, and in particular the reflection principle itself, will also be true. 
But how do we know that? Because they're independent. There's a philosophical question there. And um, Pfefferman had this idea that somehow you don't need to justify these uh, reflection principles from a stronger point of view. So for instance, if you were in piano arithmetic and you look at the consistency of piano arithmetic, well, certainly you can prove it in set theory and ZFC, which is so much stronger. But Pfefferman thought, no, if you are uh, if you are committed only to believing Peano arithmetic, then you're already implicitly committed, rationally committed to also believing in the consistency of Peano arithmetic. You don't have to, and you don't have to prove it from a stronger theory, such as set theory, in order for your, um, uh, um, for, for this um, further belief to be warranted. And, it seems to me that this is somehow for, uh, related to a form of epistemic reflection in the sense that I talked about before. And it seems to be that somehow introspection is involved here, but it's not so clear how it is involved. And um, yeah, Pfefferman was a, was a proof theorist. So he, um, um, uh, uh, Pfefferman was a proof theorist, so he had these, this philosophical idea of, um, of the, our warrant for um, proof theoretic reflection principles being somehow a bit special, but he didn't work this out in detail. He articulated this idea vaguely already in the 1960s, but philosophers of mathematics did not really uh, work this out or work on it. It's only after 2000 and especially after 2010 that philosophers of mathematics have tried to started to work out um, what may be behind this idea of implicit commitment. <clears throat> okay, this is not a circle but a spiral, I won't, won't talk about here. So let me in a nutshell try to sketch how this, how one might work out um, um, Pfefferman's ideas in detail. Of course we cannot ask if he agrees with this because, yeah, he's no longer with us. So let's start from a situation in which I, in fact, fully accept uh, the axioms of PA and the theorems that follow from it. So for instance, if I'm shown a long and complicated instance of the induction axiom of Peano arithmetic, I will look at it. I will have to, maybe it takes me a, a few seconds to see that this is an instance of induction. And then I will say, yes, I believe in that, because that's an instance of induction. Um, and so on. And if I, uh, um, yeah, and if, if someone shows me a little argument, a little proof in piano arithmetic, I follow it, I go through it step by step, and then at the end I say, yes, I believe the conclusion of this argument. Um, okay, good, because of the, because of the proof. And suppose I'm also in this situation that I accept nothing more. So I'm just a mathematician and I've never, um, um, I'm, I'm not interested so much in philosophy and I've never posed the consistency question even to myself. I've never even asked myself whether the um, formalized version of the consistency of PA, so the coded statement um, can be proved in Peano arithmetic or whatever. So that's my situation. I prove things in Peano arithmetic. I'm totally committed to Peano arithmetic, but to nothing more. Well, um, then in a first step, I can come to realize that I accept Peano arithmetic in the sense above. And that's a new step. And it's not so, not completely obvious that it's a new step, but it really is because it, it involves a form of introspection. It's, it, for, it, for, it involves um, a process in which you reflect on what you accept. You have to believe that you believe, uh, for instance, that there is a first natural number and so on and so forth. So introspection is involved here and that means that there is a relation with epistemic reflection as I described it earlier. Okay, good. So you realize that now. And then you can conduct a thought experiment. So I said in that before, I never posed the consistency question 
um, to myself at all. I just was proving things in piano arithmetic, never asked myself whether piano arithmetic is uh, consistent. But now I, c I pose this question to myself. I ask the question, well, what if I were to derive a contradiction in piano arithmetic? That's a new question that I'm asking for myself for the first time here. Well, if I'm then really a math, if I'm really a mathematician, I will answer this in only one way, and that is by saying, then I would have to revise my arithmetical beliefs drastically. I would have to drop some axioms of PA uh, for sure, huh? because otherwise uh, my activity becomes trivial, and mathematics is not a trivial activity because then I could prove everything. Okay, so I've done this thought experiment. And now I have two possibilities. Either um, um, because, because I, um, I cannot prove in Peano arithmetic the consistency of Peano arithmetic. That's what Gödel's theorem uh, says. So given that it's consistent. One thing I can do when I um, um, uh, conduct this thought experiment is to withdraw from full acceptance of piano arithmetic. I can I could say, well, look, this consistency of, of inconsistency of PA is a possibility that I cannot exclude. And that means, so it has to be given, let's say, non-zero probability, but that means that I have to lower the probability, my subjective probability of one of the axioms of PA, at least slightly beyond, below um, one. Yeah? So that means I no longer fully accept the axioms of PA and the theorems that follow from. That's a possibility. And I'm not saying that this is irrational. But you can also say, no, I continue to fully accept the, um, the um, principles of Peano arithmetic, 100% certain. But then you must form the explicit belief that um, PA is consistent. So even if, though you have not proved it, you form the belief. And that means you have not really justified it from a, you have not justified it from a stronger theory, but I claim, and I hope that um, that's what Pfefferman meant, is that it would be rational to take option two. Uh, uh, option one may also be uh, reasonable, but option two is also uh, reasonable. And I also claim that there are only two possibilities, that there are no other possibilities. So this is how, in some sense, um, through reflection, one can form um, a warranted, an epistemically warranted or rational belief in a reflection principle. Of course, th this is I'm doing it here for the simplest reflection principle consistency. One would have to see what it what it would. Uh, uh, look like for um, stronger reflection principles, whether we could also formulate an argument like this for stronger reflection uh, principles, proof theoretic reflection principles. And I'm not going to do that here. But this is just to, to, to show the connection between proof theoretic reflection principles on the one hand and epistemic reflection on the other hand. Okay, so that's all I had to say about epistemic reflection. So now, let us move to um, set theoretic reflection. And again, as I said a couple of times now, if there's something that is not clear, just um, just let me know. Just just say something because I cannot see you, and I can only hope that you can still hear me. Okay. So um, um, right, ontological reflection. Well, there are ontological reflection. There are set theoretic reflection principles that are based all on the following basic idea, and that is that the set theoretic universe, V, as a whole, is similar to one or more small parts of the set theoretic universe. And then with a small part, we mean rank initial segment um, without any loss of generality, and similar means semantically indistinguishable. So that means me making the same sentences true out of a non non-trivial um, non class of sentences. And well, this idea is, um, is, is very analogous to this uh, Philo of Alexandria idea that God is reflected in, um, in, in an angel, 
meaning that what is true for the angel is to a very large extent also true for God and vice versa. So they are very indistinguishable. Here, the set theoretic universe is reflected in a rank and national segment in the sense that what is true for one is true for the other uh, to a certain, to a large degree. Okay, so that's the idea and uh, of set theoretic reflection. And um, that already shows that inner model embedding principles do not count as set theoretic reflection principles. And these inner model embedding principles, they are really core business in large cardinal theory, pretty much, well, not every, but most large cardinal axioms can be reformulated as model embedding principles, which basically say that there is a class function from the whole set theoretic universe to an inner model such that this class function um, moves at least one ordinal upwards. Um, okay. Um, so one might say, well, doesn't that mean that the inner model reflects the set theoretic uh, universe in this sense of reflection? But the answer is no, because the um, inner models are not small. They, they contain all ordinals. So they contain proper classes. They're as big as the set theoretic universe itself in some sense. So they don't count as reflection principles. Maybe they should, that's another question, but uh, and they are not counted as reflection principles. Okay, so what kind of set theoretic reflection principles are there? Well, the first one we encounter is Montague-Levy reflection. It's a schematic principle. We work in the language of first order set theory, and then we formulate a schematic principle that if phi, then there's a rank initial segment, V alpha, such that if we restrict all the first order quantifiers to V alpha, phi is true there also. Okay, that's a, that's the, that's a first set theoretic reflection principle. Secondly, there is, um, um, uh, a second order analog of it, which is called Berenice reflection. So let us ignore the, the second order parameter, but we are looking at sentences phi in the language of second order set theory two now. So um, phi can occur, uh, can um, contain class, um, uh, uh, can contain quantifications over classes multiple quantifications over classes or over um, yeah so it's uh, over proper classes then it says if phi then there's a rank in national segment v alpha such that when you interpret the first order quantifiers of phi as ranging over v alpha over this small part and the second order quantification uh, second order qu um, uh, variables as ranging over the subsets of v alpha well, they still form a set, so that's still a small part of uh, V. Well, then the result is is uh, still true. So that's um, Bernays reflection. Bernays wrote about this, I think, late 50s or early 1960s. And then recently, um, my colleague, my former colleague, Philip Welsh, uh, proposed a um, kind of an, uh, a reflection principle which looks a little bit like um, like an like an inner model embedding principle, but it is quite an inner model embedding principle. It says that there is um, um, uh, a rank v kappa, and there is um, uh, a class embedding uh, function such that um, v kappa and um, all of its subsets is second order elementary embed, embedded by J into V with all of its classes. Now, the, the difference with the, the um, what are they called, the, the inner model principles is that, um, so this here, the V kappa, V kappa plus one, that is the analog of the inner uh, inner model. Yeah? So that's the, the, the kind of the, ref, the, the, um, the re, the, 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 the reflection of V and all of its classes. But now it is really small because it's set sized. It doesn't contain all the ordinals anymore. Okay, so that counts as a reflection principle, good. And then there are stronger um, reflection principles, for instance, by Victoria Marshall and uh, Rupert McCall, but I'm not going to talk 
photos here because I'm also slowly running out of time, I think. <clears throat> okay, so these principles are investigated in set theory. They're often second order. Um, uh, so that's a contrast with these proof theoretic reflection principle that was all first order. Here we see second order appearing um, very early on. Again, they're very they're independent of the standard axioms of set theory, and there's typically much stronger in consistency strength and proof theoretic reflection principles. And they don't have this parameter of being um, that causes them to be relative to a formal system. So they're in that sense absolute and therefore also not iterable in the same way. So they're quite different. Okay, so um, one question is how strong are set theoretic reflection principles? And there Gödel was very optimistic. He says, he said, um, I'm not going to read out his quote, he, he thought that um, all strong principles of infinity, all large cardinal axioms, can be expressed as set theoretic reflection principles. That's what he thought. And many um, set theorists later thought that this was kind of naive, that this was never going to happen. Uh, and especially now, and I think many people still think this today, for instance, Peter Kölner in Harvard, he thinks that um, um, there are no set theory, all set theoretic reflection principles that are uh, uh, plausible are compatible with V equals L, with the, the uh, set theoretic universe being the constructible universe. I don't agree with that, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a, in, a, in a second. I think Gödel's question is still completely open what the strength of these um, uh, reflection principles is. Well, uh, Montague Levy is weaker than Bernays reflection and is weaker than um, uh, Welsh reflection. Um, ZFC can prove Montague Levy, that was a fundament that's actually a fundamental theorem of set theory, but already uh, Bernays, uh, Bernays, Bernays reflection in the context of a weak class theory such as NBG, it proves um, um, non-trivial things. It proves the existence of a global well-ordering of the universe. It proves um, more scaly axioms for classes, so it entails strong class theory. And it proves that there are weakly compact cardinals. And these weakly compact cardinals, they are independent of ZFC, but they're used all over in set theory. Um, but Bernays reflection certainly is still compatible with V equals L, but Welch's reflection principle is not. Um, so Welch's reflection principle entails that there's a one extendable cardinal, and that means that there are many, many uh, um, measurable cardinals, and that means that V cannot be equal to L. So that's the situation. Okay, now... Then the question is, okay, why should we believe these set theoretic reflection principles? Again, we can put ourselves in a position where we believe all of set FC and nothing more. Why would we come to believe more? Why would we come to believe, how could we in a rational way come to believe that these set theoretic reflection principles are true? Well, many set theorists, Cantor, Gödel, uh, Penelope Maddy, um, in recent years also, they think that, um, that reflection principles have very strong epistemic support. So the argument roughly for Cantor and Gödel goes roughly as follows. V, with all of its classes, is completely undefinable, is transcendent. But there are many true statements about V and its classes. So they must all be reflected in small parts of uh, 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 v and that means that the reflection principle has that set theoretic reflection principle has set theoretic reflection has to hold. And um, yeah, well, um, why is uh, v and its classes so uh, undefinable? Well, the idea is um, that the set theoretic universe is very, very rich. It has uh, very many, uh, so many uh, structures that they. Um, in them that uh, um, that the set theoretic universe as a whole cannot be defined, cannot be singled out. <clears throat> okay, 
There are also intermediate reflection principles, and this is kind of a, a, a recent theme in proof theory, set theory. Um, for in, and one, I'm only going to briefly talk about one, and that is a, a principle that was investigated by and probably also proposed by Pakomov and Walsh recently in the past five years. And it goes as follows. By the completeness theorem, we know that a local reflection over ZFC, let's say, is equivalent to saying that if phi, do the following scheme. If phi, then there's a model um, um, that makes ZFC true and, and also uh, makes phi true. Okay, there being a model does not exclude this model to be non-standard in the sense that uh, the natural numbers in it are um, ill-founded. So you can strengthen this principle by saying that if phi, then there is an omega model. So the, the, the natural numbers are standard now of ZFC in which um, phi is true. And then the question arises, well, are we dealing with set theoretic or proof theoretic reflection principles here? And it seems the, this one is kind of in between. It's kind of in between. And if you think about it further, it seems that there may be a continuum of reflection principles between the set theoretic reflect, uh, reflection principles on the other, one hand and the proof theoretic ones on the other hand. Okay, to conclude, there's also uh, Van Fraas and what is in, in probability in probability theories, the theory of subjective probability in particular. There's Van Fraassen's reflection principle that some of you may have heard of. That's discussed quite a lot now. So forget about the antecedent. That's just uh, the, the consequent is here what matters. It says that the probability of phi, or my subjective probability of phi, given that my subjective probability of phi equals r, should be equal to r. So this is in some sense, an, this is an untyped principle in the sense that we have probability uh, for statements in which the same notion of probability occurs. So um, that, is, that makes it already in the probabilistic setting a little bit non-standard. It is a little bit Montague Levy-like if you think about it, because it means that um, um, sentence by sentence, a part, a subpart of your sample space reflects the whole sample space. <clears throat> um, and um, yeah, so it, 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 you would say, okay, that's interesting. We can connect it with forms of reflection that we're already familiar with. But um, unfortunately, um, it is inconsistent. So even though the epistemologists work with this principle a lot, you can diagonalize against it somehow. But grounded or positive versions of um, this principle are consistent. And here in this area, we know almost nothing. So, um, so already this distinction between grounded and ungrounded instances of this reflection principle just doesn't play a role in formal epistemology. They, the formal epistemologists don't think about self-reflexive um, uh, Phi's to plug into this principle and see what happens. So there's a lot of work to be done here. Okay, so that's um, um, so it's n so there there already at the formal uh, level we don't know much. We don't we know a great deal about proof theoretic reflection principles and we know quite a lot about set theoretic reflection principles, but about proof the probabilistic reflection. Um, we know in the mathematical sciences, not a lot. Okay, so I'm going to now close with a few open problems. Um, some of them have already been um, discussed and are kind of clear um, from what I've said so far, but I want to highlight them nonetheless. And maybe there's also one or two new things. There are also one or two new things here in these open problems. But in general, I think this whole area of um, reflection and reflection principles is a new theme in philosophy of mathematics, and um, the field is wide open. So there's, there's, um, you know, there are other other parts of philosophy of mathematics that have been so intensively researched now that it's hard to see how you can you can really make 
really new new contributions here but that's not the case for um, reflection and reflect uh, 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 reflection principles because that's um, all, all of this research in philosophy at least um, a philosophy of mathematics at least it's it's fairly new I would say okay so first op open problem is this idea of epistemic uh, implicit commitment by Solomon Pfefferman that in some sense these set theory these proof theoretic reflection principles they are um, epistemically supported in a very special way and this is this way that uh, Pfefferman only gestured at and I tried to make it a little bit more clear in my talk here but there's a whole lot to be um, to be done here so first of all is my argument that I've sketched here is that a convincing argument at all and if it is can you do the same thing for local reflection and uniform reflection and so on and so forth so um, understanding implicit commitment better from a philosophical point of view is one of the tasks of philosophy of mathematics today, I would argue. And quite a few people are, are now starting to work on this, actually. <clears throat> Secondly, um, I'm a little bit puzzled by this continuum between proof theoretic reflection principles and set theoretic reflection principles. Because um, I'm, I'm puzzled philosophically because Set theoretic reflection principles are um, supported um, um, by these um, transcendence of the universe arguments. And that's very diff different from these introspection arguments that seem to support proof theoretic reflection principles. But suppose that roughly that is okay. What does this say about these um, reflection principles that are in the middle. Does that mean that they're supported by some sort of mix between implicit commitment and transcendent considerations? I think at the moment nothing has been done here, so this is completely open. Uh, is there also um, a continuum in forms of epistemic warrant of reflection principles that, uh, uh, um, yeah, of these inter intermediate reflection principles and also where does probabilistic reflection fit and I think for probabilistic reflection um, to ask philosophical questions it may even at this moment be too early to to make fundamental progress here P probably we need to understand um, probabilistic reflection formally a lot better before we can start asking the um, philosophical questions in a sharp way. Okay, so that's the second open question. The third is um, um, the, a question about the warrant for set theoretic reflection principles, these justifications of set theoretic reflection principles. And then my thesis is, I mean, we live in a more and more secular society now. So um, appeal to the Bible and um, the nature of God has kind of um, disappeared from um, philosophy of mathematics in general. So Cantor uh, freely appealed to um, uh, to theological ideas for um, supporting his um, mathematical views about um, the transfinite, but later people don't anymore. Later, later uh, mathematicians don't anymore, and also philosophers of mathematics analytical philosophers of mathematics don't do this anymore but that if we cannot appeal to God and the Bible anymore then you you can ask the question whether these old um, justifications for set theoretic uh, reflection can survive um, this uh, evolution yeah. so if we ask what reasons do we have that V and its classes are highly undefinable Cantor had an answer. He said, well, look at uh, Augusta, Augustine, who says that um, the mathematical um, uh, objects are ideas in the mind of God. So if we would have um, be able to define um, the set theoretic universe, single it out um, uh, from all other structures, then we would have... Um, um, then we would thereby have knowledge of a big part of the mind of God. And that contradicts the, the transcendence of God. 
so that we cannot know God and define God. That's, that is said many places in the Old and New Testament. Um, so um, the undefinability of uh, V is supported thereby for, for Cantor. Eh? And, and maybe even still for good. But nowadays we cannot ap appeal to the Bible anymore. And then we can ask the question, what reason do we have to think that V and its classes are highly undefinable? You know, we, we're not allowed to point to a place in the Bible anymore, but we have to give arguments. And there I think there's a lack of, uh, of arguments uh, at the moment. Um, so that's kind of also a bit strange from a... Um, from the point of view of philosophy of mathematics. Okay, and then probabilistic reflection. It's given that we do not understand anything here, even formally, we understand very little. Um, well, the first question would be rather a, rather a technical one. Understand probabilistic reflection better from a type-free formal perspective. And here I, would, I think um, the suggestion is to um, explore the analogy between subjective probability on the one hand and truth, so type-free subjective probability on the one hand and type-free truth on the other hand, because we do know a lot about type-free truth by these days. And truth can be seen as a zero-one measure, whereas the subjective probability um, measure, subjective probability, um, um, of course, has... Um, has, uh, makes use of many, many more um, values um, than just zero and one. So understanding type-free subjective probability from a proof th theoretic point of view might be, I suggest, a fruitful way, a uh, fruitful thing to try to do. Okay, and I think that's everything. So um, I'm trying to uh get out of this now and i'll stop sharing my screen i think and i thank you for your attention so any questions i can pull up my uh, slides again if we need to uh, or any comments um well uh, thank you for for listening to me <clears throat> yes thank you so much leon are there any questions Yes, Mikhail. Uh, hello, do you hear me? Hello, yes. Yes, my name is uh, Mikhail. I work in the field of reflection, but in another direction. And uh, before I started to work in my direction, I thought a lot about reflection and I had one idea, which I never met in the literature. And I want to ask you about that principle of reflection. Maybe you know something about it. Uh, maybe it's new, I don't know. Uh, consider set theory. And no, first, before considering set theory, consider uh, predicate logic. Consider second order predicate logic. So we have two types of variables. We have variables which denote objects and we have second order variables which denote sets of objects and uh, if we want to write uh, logical axioms for second order predicate logic then we see that those axioms are axioms of the theory uh do you understand what i mean um, if you want to write axioms for second order logic, they are axioms of set theory. You mean uh, like logical, a axiom. logical ax okay. axioms? Logical axioms. Logical axioms. So, for instance, a comprehension axiom, you mean? Um, uh, I mean, uh, that discussions uh, were popular many years ago when people thought about what kind of set theory is better. Is it better to use first order set theory or is it better to use second order set theory? And uh, during that discussions in middle uh, 20th, uh, there one of reasons why people concentrated on ZFCs, first order set theory, 
was that actually there is uh, it's hard to distinguish between um axioms for that for set theory from one point of view and from logical axioms for second order predicate logic okay. because actually uh, second order variables denote sets and if we know something about sets we need to say something about sets to say something about this second order variables and uh, then what's the difference with uh, our first order set theory and axioms about set in that language and first okay. order language is much better because of it's complete uh, it's, uh, and so on okay then now i start to that idea about reflection uh consider we work in second order set theory and consider we prove a theorem uh about sets in this second order set theory then we may look at that theorem which says something about sets and we can look at that theorem from point of view of something which says for us something about second order variables and we can use that theorem and put uh, the duplicate of that theorem in the base of our second order predicate logic as a new logical axiom for second order predicate logic uh, and this is a kind of reflection. Uh, this is um, that idea. Do you understand what I mean? Well, uh, roughly, but not not completely. So we we look at second order set theory. So yes, Zeta, ZFC two. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay, and and that proves certain uh, uh, statements as that talk not just about sets, but also about proper classes of sets? Mm, let us consider a theorem which says something about sets. A theorem okay. which says something about uh, classes is, it, is a meta theorem, if you work in ZFC style. So let's consider ordinary theorem, uh, which says something about sets, but remember that we have, a, mm, ah, maybe it's not important. Okay. so. We have proved some theorem about sets in ZFC2, second order yeah. ZFC. Uh, then look at uh, logical axioms of predicate logic, which is the base of ZFC2 because it used second order predicate logic in its base. Those uh, logical, uh, logical axioms, which are in the base of second order uh, predicate logic, so they're in the base of ZFC2. Uh, they, from general point of view, say something about sets, but uh, mm -hmm. in the language of uh, two types of variables. Then, suppose we have proved theorem phi in ZFC2, then we can formulate the same what that phi, that theorem says, but uh, in language which we use to formulate logical axioms for predicate logic of second order. And we can put this phi into the base of, among other logical axioms for second order predicate logic. And when we do it, this may be, it will make our predicate logic of second order stronger, and then it will make our ZFC stronger. So ZFC theorems will make a base of logic, which lies in the base of ZFC2 stronger, and maybe it will make ZFC2 stronger, and uh, this uh, is a kind of reflection principle from my point of view. Did you hear okay. anything similar? Okay, so I, I think that for me that's a new idea. I have not heard it before. Um, I'm still trying to under understand it. So, so second order predicate logic, um, is it? Um, is it formulated in the language which has an epsilon symbol or not? Uh, do you mean uh, epsilon, which means to set be a member of uh, X be a member of a set, uh, for example, M? Epsilon is uh, yeah, something like that. So the reason why I'm just asking is is about uh -huh. the languages. Huh? So it's sec second order set theory has this epsilon symbol. Yes, and, and, it should, and it should because 
Yes, yes, it should have this symbol because uh, no, we want to say that variable of first type X is a member of the set denoted by variable of second class, for example, variable M. So we should have this symbol uh, as a logical symbol. It's not, uh, as, yes, it's, so maybe okay. we have two symbols, maybe, yes, yes, I understand. Uh, maybe in ZFC2, we will have two symbols. First one, the lo logical symbol, which says about connection between first order variables and second order variables. And uh, maybe we should have independent symbol. I don't know. Maybe we should use that one. It's, uh, it's discussable. Uh, okay. Okay, and I want to say that uh, axioms, logical axioms for first or for second order predicate logic uh, and rules for them, uh, they are very different than uh, axioms and rules for first order. Because if you uh, want to use some system uh, for first order predicate logic, you can use only one rule, uh, mod exponents in Gödel style or no, in Gilbert style. And uh, you may have many logical axioms, um, but if you want to work in second order predicate logic, uh, the modus ponens rule is not enough maybe, and the, uh, among your logical axioms should be comprehension principle as a logical axiom, which says something about first and second order variables and so on. Yeah. Yes, I think I think um, yeah, I, that sounds interesting to me. Um, so one thing is um, so that there is this connection between um, second order logic and set theory that has been kind of a theme in philosophical logic. So already I think Boulos in the 1970s points out, but this was already known probably, that mm -hmm. um, there is a second order statement. Uh, uh, um, uh, a statement of second order logic um, that is true if and only if the continuum that is logically true if and only if true in all models in, in all full second order models if and only if the continuum hypothesis holds for instance mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that means that 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 second order logic is somehow i mean that is certainly true it is second order logic is Highly set theoretical, and of course very incomplete and and, and all, of, all, all. Yes, it should be. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, of course. Um, so then, if the continuum hypothesis turns out to be true, then there is this pure second order logical truth that you might want to put down as an axiom of second order. Yes, logic. yes, I uh, read uh, these kind of papers uh, about. Yeah. Uh, Th that what you are saying now yeah okay so so um, um yeah i think it's an interesting idea have you have you worked it out in detail how it goes no or... because uh, i i'm working on a different idea completely different and uh, so i do not have time to this one i want to find a student uh, whom hmm. to give him it is uh, no, to work about, but uh, now I do not have one. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the idea is that, um, I hope I'm not taking too much time trying to understand what you're saying, but um, so you, you have ZFC, the second order ZFC proves mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. And um, and um, um, and then, um, um, and then you can you say that you you can just take this um, as um, a second order um, logical axiom. Yes. But does that mean that you can take any axiom of ZFC two also as a logical axiom? Uh, yes, I can. Like you can. Okay. Yes, why not? Yeah. Um, um, so, for instance, that every set has a power set, then becomes a logical truth. Uh, yes, we can uh, use it as a logical axiom. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. Then you certainly strengthen. Um, then you certainly strengthen um, the axioms of set the, uh, of second order logic enormously already in this first step, right? Mm. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe. Looks like. Yeah, because because I think ZFC two easily proves the the consistency of um, uh, second order logic. Ah, okay, understand. Yes, yes, so, yes, yes. So yes, you, yes. you so mm -hmm. you immediately in one step you get the whole the whole strength of second order set theory by mm -hmm. one one step of your reflection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and but I don't see how it's iterable though. I see you can do oh. this in one. Because you already have everything after one step, and then yes, maybe maybe it will not give um, any, uh, more power. We should it should be studied, <laughs> of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you will know someone who is interested in this uh, idea and wants to study it, uh, I would uh, I uh, I will be happy to maybe. Email okay. Somebody, yeah. But, uh, it's interesting for me. Right. Okay. So I'll 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 um, I'll see I'll I'll look around here if they, if I can Thank find you. students who who. Are, but it's an interesting idea. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to somehow continue in the context of this question. Uh, so I guess if you have. If we have a proof of some theorems in ZFC2, and then we add it as a logical axiom to the second order logic, uh, and I guess we could treat epsilon symbol as a predication in the context of second order logic, probably. But I think there will be some problems with logicality, isn't it? Yes, that exactly because because in second order um, uh, predicate logic you don't really need um, an epsilon symbol. I think that's what you're saying. You we can just yeah. treat it as predication. But um, in um, in um, in in ZFC two, you certainly do need uh, uh, an epsilon symbol. So um, and. The epsilon relation is traditionally regarded as uh, as a non-logical relation. It's only plus yeah. and uh, it's only equality, negation, conjunction, first order quantification. They they are regarded as the logical notions. So yes, um, yeah, there will be that will certainly be a question then. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, but but still there is some some idea. Um, uh there is there may be there may be some something deep behind what Mikhail was saying that 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 really needs to be explored is that i think i think i think if if you just say okay if zfc2 proves something you just add it to the um to the axioms of second order logic and then strengthen your second order logic by second order logic plus then you work in ZFC second order logic plus, and you have new theorems again, and you can bootstrap that way. Um, that is maybe maybe some restrictions have to be put on what kind of theorems you want to um, somehow regard as second order logical theorems. Otherwise, it will just explode a bit too much, I think. But there may be there may be very interesting ways that this can be done. That that's how I understand his idea, but. Uh, might be worth looking into. Right. It looks like uh, Pfefferman's uh, idea of hierarchy of reflection principles, something like that, I think. Um, Probably. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it would give it would give rise to a progression of formal theories. You'd start from ZFC2 and then you'd go to um, ZFC two plus, let's say, where the where it's based on a stronger logic, and you have new theorems, you'd add them again to the logic somehow. You transfer them, then you get to ZFC plus plus, and you can iterate this into the transfinite, um, um, and you can you can ask yourself, um, 
Yeah, you can try to prove theoretically, investigate this whole hierarchy. Yes, so, yes. But first one would have to get the basic, the basics right and precise, I think. Yeah. So uh, another uh, unrelated question. If I understood correctly, you mentioned that you don't agree with V is not equal L. That is, you accept V equals L, right? What no. justifies your belief? No, no I don't. I, I, I think that V does not equal L. Ah, okay. I think most most uh, most set theorists would, um, and and the reason is just that um, that. Uh, yeah, this this whole large cardinal hierarchy from mm -hmm. has been studied so intensively and it looks so natural and everything seems to fit so well linearly. And um, uh, no, I think V equals L is a restrictive axiom that I, I, I do not want to accept. No. Mm -hmm. So, Grigori, please. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, so uh, you draw a line between reflection and introspection. Uh, is this line always implied? Uh, I mean that introspection usually uh, under understood uh, as a, uh, a uh, is a, um, a posteriori. Uh, a thing uh, or something like that, uh, uh, at least in the literature of philosophy of mind, uh, for example, uh, Chalmers, uh, and the principle of reflection are uh, a priori, uh, as far as I understand. Um, so in general, um, uh, can you clarify uh, the connection between reflection uh, and uh, introspection? Uh, okay, that's an interesting question and not an easy one to answer for me. Um, so whether introspection, so thinking about your own thoughts and forming higher order uh, thoughts about your, uh, you know, what you believe that you believe and so on, or what you know that you know, um, or believe that you know, and so on and so forth, whether these processes are a priori or a posteriori is debated, I think, in epistemology. So some some people see it as um, as um, as uh, a posteriori processes, and other people see it as a priori pro processes. So I think people like Tyler Birch see it as a priori, and I don't know Chalmers' work very well, but he may be among the large group of people who see that as a posteriori um, processes, and. Um, but you are right that this means that if introspection plays um, a role in um, uh, in our warrant for proof theoretic reflection principles, then this discussion also um, uh, then there will also be philosophers who who would say that um, we know proof theoretic reflection principles a priori, maybe people like Tyler Birch. And other people, maybe like Chalmers, who would say that we know them a posteriori. Um, now, what do I think? Um, uh, um, well, I'm, I'm more on the a priori side, but I don't know if I have really good arguments. Um, so, for instance, Descartes, he would think, well, okay, the cogito, that's a priori knowledge. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, th I think I just don't know what I would say there. Um, such, a, such a difficult debate in uh, epistemology and philosophy of mind. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I can't really... <laughs> I would have to think about it. Okay, uh, just a small question. Uh, implicit commitment. Is it more into epistemic reflection or into ontological uh, reflection? Because uh, it is related to accepting a given theory, but also it is somehow related to the concept of truth 
which is well rather more ontological than just epistemic um okay good question uh, again but i think so the the story that i gave about consistency uh, anyway was supposed not to uh, involve the concept of truth at all so you know i wrote um, um a little article about this and it's called on reflection it's in philosophical quarterly and it's also on my website i think but there this is important for me that this argument, this um, um, this reflection process that I've kind of sketched in this talk, that um, it does not involve the concept of truth, at least for consistency. The concept of truth is totally not involved. So the, the idea is that um, you have a mathematician and she just does piano arithmetic. She, she proves things in piano arithmetic and she's kind of she doesn't have to have any philosophical commitments, even whether the notion of truth is um, is um, is acceptable at all. And still, she should be able to um, to come to a situation where she rationally believes in the consistency of PA. So I think I, I think you you, you I, I sent you the slides. If you look at this this little sketched argument, I hope that the the concept of truth does not uh, appear there. And in any case, where I try to write it out in, um, in a lot of detail in this little paper on reflection, I, I've, tr I've really scrupulously tried to avoid using the concept of truth. Because, and the reason is that what I've also tried to avoid is appeal of this mathematician to stronger theories, such as ZFC or second order arithmetic or something like that. If she was allowed that, then yes, of course she could, she could prove the consistency of piano arithmetic and much more, but then you're begging the question that, that is circular. But if you involve the concept of truth, then you also kind of um, are dangerously close to that because if, because if you involve the concept of truth, then the concept of truth also has to be governed by certain axioms, principles. For instance, disquotational principles, maybe compositional principles of truth. If you really want to spell out these arguments, and then again, you are, um, if you have a theory plus compositional theories uh, axioms of truth for them, then often these are non-conservative already. Then you can already prove the consistency of uh, of the theory you started out with. So then you again you're circular, and and um, that's what I wanted to avoid. So I would say okay. that the um, the uh, implicit commitment is all on the epistemic side. It should not be on the ontological side. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? May I ask you a question about? the book, Metaphysics and Mathematics of Arbitrary Objects. Of course. Thank you. Um, when uh, reading the chapter seven devoted to Keat Fine's theory of arbitrary objects, we didn't understand what properties are attributed to the dependent relations. In particular, can any arbitrary objects depend on itself? And if so, are all, all arbitrary objects like that? You wrote that from your point of view. Uh, this issue uh, is decided simply by convention, but it's not uh, clear what point of view find, uh, find takes to here. Um, Yes, I, um, okay, so I have to put my mind uh, a different state now. Um, 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 well, let's, let's, let's see what I um, want. Well, I mean, the, the, I thought, but maybe I'm wrong, but what I thought is that, okay, so there are these, these relations where um, um, you can ask yourself, well, do they apply, do, um, are they reflexive? For instance, in, in metaphysics, you have this idea of being a part of myriology. Um, 
uh, says that you know material objects one material object can be a part of, a, of another material object and then there's a the question does every material object is it a part of itself or not or some are and some are not and then it seems there are only two two reasonable answers one is um, every material object is a part of itself and another is um, no material object is a part of itself but to say some of them are, some of them are not, that seems kind of strange. And then I think if, if these are the only two options, all of them are part of themselves or none of them are, then it doesn't really matter. Then it seems to me um, almost a, a matter of convention that if you say, well, you know, in, in some sort of limiting sense, they're all part of themselves. Okay, fine. If you say, no, no, strictly speaking, you know, they, none of them is a part of itself. Um, that would be fine with me too. But the overall structure of the theory would be very similar. I mean, you'd have a very sim very easy translation uh, procedure from one theory to the other. So they're kind of the same theory for me. I, I don't. And um, for arbitrary objects, I would say the same. I would say, well, you know, you can say that every object depends on itself. Fine. Um, but. Um, or you could say no object depends on itself. That's for me just as fine, but it seems to me, I wouldn't, I, I don't really know a very good way of making sense of saying some objects, arbitrary objects depend on themselves and others don't. If I would have, then I think the, the, the question becomes really interesting because then you could say, well, on, under what conditions does an object depend on itself and when does it not depend on itself? And that can be very complicated, uh, an intricate structure that would be very interesting. And, um, um, and I have no argument, no reason to think that that cannot happen, eh? that, that the situation might not be like that. It's just that I couldn't think of anything. Um, I, I, I thought, well, it's going to be like with the part which relation. Everything is a part of itself or nothing is a part of itself. Every, every arbitrary object depends on itself or none of them do. And then it doesn't matter for me really what you, what you choose. But maybe I've just missed something. And Kit Fine says, well, I'm, if I remember right, that it, then Kit Fine takes this uh, view that objects, arbitrary objects don't depend on themselves, right? So that's, uh, that's kind of the, the opposite point of view um, that, that's, but you you might you might be able to f come up with good reasons for taking some arbitrary objects to depend on themselves and others not. Um, yeah, but there too, this theory of arbitrary objects it's uh, it's um, so few people have worked on it that um, yeah, I think it's 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 uh, so many things are open and and have not been discussed much so. Um, I think it's worth worth looking looking into these things more more deeply. I'm sorry. Does that answer your question a little bit, or or not at all? Thanks. Uh, and I have another question about uh, chapter four. Uh, you mentioned uh, mentioned there that arbitrary object can be. Uh, used in semantics of natural language. Uh, may you give more details on this issue? Well, I, the, I, I hope that I wrote, uh, that I gave some references, or did I not? Um, because, uh, 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 no, I, I just, I just saw one, one, one reference to uh, the work on uh, semantics of anaphora uh, with yes. uh, arbitrary objects. Yes. So I, so when I wrote the, this textbook, I wanted to know what, what, what the literature was on arbitrary objects. When I wrote this book, I wanted to know what had people written about arbitrary objects. And surprisingly, you could kind of do this because so little has been written about arbitrary objects um, and um, one 
aspect was, well, what are applications of arbitrary objects? And, and in linguistics, that's one area where they had been applied a little bit. And then I, there I just found a few articles. This anaphora thing is one of them. Um, there were a few that I don't remember off, off hand, but if you write me an email, I will try to look it up. Um, um, yeah, I think I found about four articles in linguistics where they made use of arbitrary objects to some extent. Um, but, um, but I, um, yeah, I didn't discuss this in the book. I, I didn't, um, um, yeah, I didn't pursue it. I was more in the, in the, in the, the, the other applications because I'm kind of a philosopher of mathematics more than a philosopher of linguistics or, or a semanticist. But I think, yeah, I think it's definitely worth, worth looking into that too. But it, it was just kind of outside my, um, yeah, outside my field, more or less. Thank you. I understand. Okay, any more questions? Okay, then another question from me. Uh, let's say we have a mathematician and mathematician works in piano arithmetic and uh, finds a proof of some fancy, fancy statement, uh, for example. And we allow that mathematician to use Pfefferman's uh, reflection principles on piano arithmetic. Then in the extended theory, that mathematician may say something about the truth of piano arithmetic, right? Um, did no, no, I would say no, because uh, it only if uh, you expand the language with a new predicate or a new concept, the truth concept. But if you just add um, consistency statements or iterations of consistency statements or iterations of uniform reflection, you stay in the language of Peano arithmetic and then you just cannot talk about arithmetical truth. It's not definable. Not about full uh, arithmetical truth. So you, you cannot, you cannot, for instance, even say all the axioms of Peano arithmetic are true unless you introduce a new um, predicate. Okay, but what if we use this global reflection principle? So we um, extend our language with the truth predicate and use global yeah. reflection principle, so. Then we can, yes, then, then we can. And then, but then there's a question, okay, then we need something, to, some laws to govern the truth predicate too. So for instance, you want to maybe add something like for every, for every, the scheme for every phi, which is arithmetical, phi if and only if true of phi, the Tarski by conditionals mm -hmm. for the underlying language. If you do that, um, um, uh, and uh, reflection and global reflection, yeah, I mean, you, then you can prove for instance, that all axioms of PA are true, or maybe even that all theorems of PA are true, and so on. Yes. Okay, but what if we treat uh, some even weak reflection principles, like consistency principle, as an epistemic uh, kind of epistemic instrument to investigate into PN arithmetic, but not in a formal way. Uh, say, most notably, David Hilbert claimed that consistency is enough for existence, right? So if mathematical theory is consistent, then the objects of this mathematical theory do exist. Do we have a 
kind of justification for the same uh, for the same kind of reasoning in case of reflection principles. Um, how do you mean? I mean, consistency is a reflection principle. Yes. So, um, yes, so um, Hilbert, uh, Hilbert, Hilbert um, claimed that if a theory is mathematical theory of consi is consistent, then there is a mathematical structure that it is about or something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, um, so if I accept the uh, consistency of piano arithmetic, I should, well, I, I am committed to believe that there's a structure corresponding to piano arithmetic. It exists somehow, and then I should probably commit it to the truth of piano arithmetic. Okay, okay, okay. So, um, so f one thing um, um, we have is that if if a theory is consistent, if a first order theory is consistent, then then it has a model. That's the completeness theorem. Mm. So, um, no, if a first order theory is consistent, then it has a model. That's a completeness theorem, and it can be proved in set theory. That is true. Mm -hmm. um, so, but if we if we but again, uh, um, and one question is, uh, is that a reflection principle? Um, it is a little bit like global reflection. You need, you need to go beyond first order arithmetic even to state it, because first order arithmetic talks about the numbers, but it cannot talk about sets. Uh, and, um, um, but models are sets. So somehow you have to extend the language in order to even formulate this uh, principle a bit. Um, um, but you can, of course, but I mean, there, I think, just as with, um, with, um, with the, tru the notion of truth, some philosophers may accept this and they say, okay, I'm happy to accept the notion of truth. That is a coherent notion. And some people uh, would say, I am happy to accept the notion of set. That's a coherent notion. Um, and then these, these kind of principles become, um, become very compelling. But you may also be a philosopher who is suspicious about the notion of truth and who would say, well, no, this is a, this is a, a very suspect philosophical notion, I don't want to commit, I don't want to use this notion because I don't know if it's coherent. And there are also people who are worried about the coherence of the notion of, of, of uh, set in this way. And if you're one of those people, then you don't want to accept um, if a theory is consistent and it has a model. But I think Hilbert went a little bit further in the sense that he said he did not just want to say if something is consistent, then it has a model. But then he, he said that if it's if um, if a, a theory is consistent, then it has a, a subject matter. Uh, 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 he, 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 well, I'm, I'm not sure I'm not a Hilbert specialist, of course, but I thought that he, he meant that it has a unique subject matter. Because consistency can entail that there's one model, but there could be many models. And then you can ask yourself, well, what is this theory about? So, for instance, arithmetic has many models, one standard model, standard, we call it standard, but um, many non-standard models, which model is it about? And I thought that, uh, but I'm not sure, that, 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 that Hilbert thought that if a theory is consistent, then it has a unique uh, model that it's about, a, a unique structure that is about. Yes, uh, he, he, yeah, probably he thought about structure, right? Not, not just objects, uh, at least not yeah. 
about some definite objects, which is also justified in his uh, famous quote about tables and beer marks and so on about geometry. Uh, okay, so there's another question from Arsen, who unfortunately had to disconnect. Uh, uh, the question is as follows. In your book, The Metaphysics and Mathematics of Arbitrary Objects, you wrote that you adhere to the methodological position of naive metaphysics, inheriting Kit Fine. I would like to ask a little side question about how close are you to the views on metaphysics of Kant and Carnap, the period of empiricism, semantics, and ontology, as well as modern neo carnapians Okay, so, um, yeah, so I thought, uh, so um, I really like this methodological um, um, yeah, this methodological view of Kit Fine, of naive metaphysics, that um, the uh, questions about the nature of things come first, and whether then they really understand, uh, really exist, they come second, if at all. So there, actually, I also differ a little bit with Kit Fine. I'm happy with the first questions. Metaphysics looks into the nature of um, of properties, certain properties, relations, kinds of objects, and so on and so forth. And these existence questions, well, I I don't don't really understand them very well. Even though, yeah, so there I differ a little bit from Kit Fine. So that's one thing. And um, how does this correspond to um, Carnap's view? Well, Carnap had this idea that um, the, he makes this distinction between internal questions and external questions. Um, so he says, well, intern, internal in arithmetic, we can ask um, whether there are numbers and then there would be, well, of course there are numbers. I mean, our axioms say that there is a first number, a second number and so on and so forth. Yes, of course. But from an external point of view, you can say, well, but what I mean is, do they really exist? And then you're not asking an internal question in arithmetic, but you're asking it externally from an external perspective. And there you don't have a framework anymore, um, a Carnap says, to answer these questions. So, um, um, so externally, they don't even make sense. That's um, does it, the question, does the number three really exist as an external question? doesn't really make much sense for, for, for Carnap. And there I differ, I, I disagree with Carnap because I think that um, what he calls these external questions, well, they're really metaphysical questions. And just as arithmetic has its own, um, its own rules, its own framework, metaphysics also has its own rules, its own framework. So these metaphysical questions, what Carnap calls metaphysical questions, I think do make sense from this naive uh, point of view that uh, um, um, Kit Fine talks about. There, there are things that are, um, um, yeah, that are, yeah. I mean, it 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 has its own. It 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 does have its own rules, and that's absolutely fine. So I'm happy with what Carnap calls external questions. And I think um, there are um, uh, right answers and wrong answers, and they're not just a matter of, um, what is it uh, called? He calls it like a pragmatic questions. He says, well, that's just, you know, you can choose to say yes, you can choose to say no, whatever is more useful. And questions about the frameworks themselves. I, d I don't think that's, that's true. It's, it, it, uh, that's right, I think. There is um, there's truth and falsehood in metaphysics, good theories and bad theories. So I'm not a Carnapian there. I, I, I really am not. And Kant, that is of course uh, uh, that is very difficult to say because I don't. Um, I think, as far as I know, um, um, it is a very difficult interpretative question about you know Kant and metaphysics uh, what 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 is Kant's stance on metaphysics um, 
So the, some later philosophers, the idealist uh, Schelling and Hegel, they 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 took this in um, in a certain direction that maybe Kant would not have been very happy with. I don't know. And other people um, um, thought that Kant's um, uh, uh, Kant's view Kant was very skeptical about metaphysics in the end. Well, I'm not skeptical about metaphysics. So in that sense, so that interpretation of Kant, I don't, that's not um, my view. Like Kit Fine, who is not skeptical about, at all about metaphysics. I'm just as, just like Kit Fine. I'm not skeptical about metaphysics at all. I think it's a great discipline. It has its own rules. There's progress. Um, some theories are better than others and so on and so forth. Um, um, and then the other direct, the other view of Kant, um, Kant on metaphysics, I've never been able to understand very well. So I, um, yeah, so um, yeah, that has to do with, uh, uh, yeah, everything that Kant says about uh, about what is transcendental. So his transcendental deductions and. Um, that um, I found not so easy to understand, I must say. And, um, but I do think, so, okay, so it is co complicated. So he has these antinomies of reason, so God, the subject, and the world that are somehow intrinsically paradoxical in nature, these things, so that if you reason about them, you end up in antinomies. There, I think he, he was, he was right, basically. He just didn't. He didn't see it very clearly. But for instance, that um, that um, yeah, the set theoretic paradoxes, like Russell's paradox, that means that if you think about everything and treat it as an object, you kind of um, get into into problems. So um, it seems to me that um, Kant kind of foreshadowed that a little bit. So those those elements of his of his if that's part of his metaphysics, then I think he was right about that. But for me, this is not at all a reason to be uh, skeptical about metaphysics in general. So I, I don't consider myself a Kantian either. And the Neo-Kantians, so there are Neo-Kantians, Kassir and these people, I don't know them very well. And then there are the... Um, the Kantians, um, the uh, neo carnapian the Neo-Kantians, I don't know very well, the neo carnapians there I have kind of think of Hannes Leitgeb in München, for instance. Um, what do I think about that? Um, I don't know. I, I, I think I just don't know that literature well enough to have a, to have a judgment. Does that help or not? I know it was kind of all over the place, my answer, but... Yeah, I, I want to add it um, uh, in this discussion. So, uh, when I was reading your book, uh, I had uh, a clear idea that uh, you're some kind of neo carnapian and the radical one, so I, I, I misunderstood it, uh, of course. and. Uh, uh, I had some confusion because uh, Fine, uh, Kit Fine usually classified as a, a counter Carnapian, yes, as a realist about meta ontology, and uh, uh, he thinks that uh, um, in, uh, external existing questions uh, matter uh, and so on. Um, but he usually um, uh, understood uh, as a uh, neo-Aristotelian, so uh, that idea that uh, uh, we need to uh, worry about uh, what is the relation between things, uh, what what are the links, uh, and uh, uh, after Fine's work, uh, th th there were uh, famous Jonathan Sheffer's uh, paper on what grounds what, so we, we, we need not to worry about uh, what exists because uh, existence uh, questions are, uh, in a sense, trivial, everything exists, uh, exists uh, but uh, uh, we need to think about what grounds what, so this is uh, new Aristotelian meta-ontological uh, meta -ontological framework, uh, so uh, maybe uh, can you um, relate uh, your uh, methodology in philosophy of mathematics uh, to uh, to this Neo-Aristotelian idea? 
Okay, so now I think, so thanks very much for that question because it made me um, understand Lev's question better, I think. So now I understand what's puzzling you. So um, yes, a Kit Fine is a realist and some sort of neo-Aristotelian. But that is, so he has this, for him, metaphysics has two stages. So there's the naive stage, and then there's the, 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 the second stage is the stage of reality, more or less. Uh, so what is reducible to what, what really exists, and, 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 and so on and so forth. So these two stages. And I think the first stage, that is great. That is what, what, what I'm, I completely accept of Kit Fine. And that's how I try to do metaphysics when I do it. But second stage, I don't understand at all. And, the, and this has to do with what you talked about, is the, um, is the grounding stuff. So there's this idea that is uh, now, um, a lot of people are working on this in metaphysics, is the truth makers grounding and uh, metaphysical explanation and, uh, uh, and, so, and so on and so forth. And I don't understand, I don't think I, I'm skeptical about these concepts. I'm skeptical about grounding. I'm skeptical about metaphysical explanation. I'm skeptical um, about all 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 of that. Um, so um, so I kind of half half agree with uh, Kit Fine and half completely disagree with Fine. So I'm not a realist, um, a metaphysical realist in that sense. I don't. Um, 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 but I do think so you, that the external questions matter because they are metaphysical questions, and we can answer them. Um, but we do this in this first naive um, stage, and then we just stop. Then we just don't say, okay, so now we've looked into, let's say, the nature of arbitrary objects, just to give an example. And now we move to the second stage: do these things really exist? And um, um, and so on and so forth. Or can they be reduced to something else? Kit Fine think they can be, they, they are not fundamental, they can be reduced to something else. I don't do that at all because I don't understand the questions. And um, yeah, so that, that means that I don't completely uh, agree with uh, Kit Fine at all, but I'm also not a neo Carnapian and not a radical one because I do think that the, these external questions matter, they're good questions. We have good frameworks for investigating them, and those are the frameworks of naive metaphysics. We can develop really good theories, fruitful theories, and some often we also develop theories that are no good at all, and then we throw them away. Um, um, yeah, so I'm I'm um, I'm not not a not a neo Carnapian, not a neo Carnapian, and only half. A, Half a fine end of that. <clears throat> okay, are there any more questions? I'd like to ask a very general question. Um, how do you assess this uh, sort of metaphysical turn in contemporary analytic philosophy? Uh, as uh, is known, met metaphysics was generally avoided or even prohibited for a very long time in early analytic philosophy. What do you think about it? Um, yes, that's that's a very difficult question and a very good question. The metaphysical turn. Um, yeah, so there was the before the metaphysical turn, there was the linguistic turn in in uh, in philosophy, and um well i'm old enough to know that um around the end of the 1980s one had the feeling that this this turn was kind of exhausted a little bit it was all tired so there were questions that we made uh, well me and not, not me but that that philosophers had made real progress on for instance kripke was the big figure there and there were questions that seemed to, where people seemed to be stuck um um, forever and no, no real uh, question, no real uh, uh, progress was made. For instance, the problem of quantifying into um, propositional attitude questions, de re knowledge, and all these kind of things seemed just as mysterious as 50 years earlier. And then I think people were kind of open for something new. For for for. 
yeah for for kind of a paradigm change and then david david lewis was the big figure there i think already already quine was um, was influential but um, but um, quine was still half a logical empiricist to so much but but um, yeah i think david lewis was then um, kind of started this this metaphysical turn it still seems to be going on, um, um, but I don't really have a very good overview, I must admit, because um, there is a whole part of it that I don't understand, and that's everything that has to do with metaphysical causation, metaphysical grounding, metaphysical explanation. And there are little bits that I think I can, I can maybe contribute to a little bit. Um, um, but I do think, I do think, I do kind of, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly sympathetic to the whole uh, metaphysical turn. And that's maybe also because of my, um, my, my views in, in philosophy of mathematics. I've always kind of leaned to some sort of Platonistic, um, uh, uh, p positions in that area. And then, um, um yeah and then you you you're kind of close to metaphysics anyway so you you're going to accept abstract objects in your ontology and that's already something that the logical empiricist would would not want or and the logical empiricist tried to uh, reduce mathematics to logic that didn't work but that was also anti metaphysical so i've always been in philosophy of mathematics already on the other side on the sort of more metaphysical side and that meant that in yeah in more recent work I've I've, I've also tried to try to look at um, at just um, core metaphysics outside philosophy of uh, 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 language and I also like that um, so yes I th I think well I mean um, I um, I think that the work in metaphysics nowadays is very is varied very uh, is a great variation so some work in this area i don't really understand very well and actually some of it i think is not very high quality at all but there's also some very good work that has been done and i think kit fine has done is one of the people who is rightly famous as a metaphysician at the moment because he's done some very good work but doing very good work is very hard so yeah, most of us will probably <clears throat> have to do mediocre work for the most of our lives, but yeah. Okay, are there any more questions? I have a question uh, just for clarification uh, about uh, your point uh, concerning your theory of uh, of natural numbers as a special kind of arbitrary numbers uh, is this a metaphysical explanation metaphysical theory or or only mathematical framework uh, to uh, to do some common ground uh, to the theory of the mathematical theory of arbitrary objects uh, and um, regular natural numbers. Um, well, I thought I thought <clears throat> so. I, I think in in theory of arbitrary objects, there's there are really two parts of it. There's the um, the 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 general theory of um, arbitrary objects. That's one thing. And um, there are applications of the theory of arbitrary objects on the other hand. And I think both are important. And I think b both need to be worked out in much more detail. And we, we need a lot more research on it. So, um, and um, I was always interested in what this, what arbitrary um, objects can be uh, philosophically applied to, what they are philosophically good for. If they would be good for nothing, if I could think of no applications, then I probably would not be very interested in the general theory as well. And then I thought, well, one, one uh, a possible application is mathematical structures. Um, 
and then um, and then I found out while I was reading writing this book, actually rather late, that Kit Fine actually already had this idea in this 1998 paper towards the end. It was just very in this Journal of Philosophy paper, very condensed, but he clearly already had thought about that. I mean, there's so many. So many instances of that where you think you do something original and then someone like Kit Fine has already already uh, been there, so to speak. But I was not satisfied, not quite satisfied with uh, Kit Fine's theory because there was an, uh, a version of the permutation problem that that it uh, that is subject to. I still think that. So I try. I thought I can do better, um, and um, so. That's what I then tried to do in this one chapter um, in, in the book, but that's not right either. So Kit Fine then wrote a review of my book in which he, and this review is really um, concentrated on um, what I say about mathematical structure. He says, oh, lots of nice things, but he, what he says about mathematical structures, that cannot be right. And and I must admit that Kit Fine is, is 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 he's right about that so he says so basically he says um you know you have all these arbitrary omega sequences to choose from and you and and um and one of them has to be the real um generic omega sequence or the subject matter of the natural number uh, of, of arithmetic but why choose one rather than the other basically that's uh, that's his 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 objection and that's a good one too so I think um, Kit Fine's theory, as he um, sketched it, was not satisfactory. My theory, as I, I try to do better, is also not satisfactory. So um, what I've tried to do in a little paper recently, um, and I can send it to you if you send me an, an email, I will just send you this little paper, is where I try to kind of come up with a synthesis of um, where I uh, of Kit Fine's ideas and and my ideas and and I, I presented this um, paper I think a year ago maybe now one and a half years ago in uh, where was it in Lugano in in Switzerland and Kit Fine was there and he said yeah that that looks about right so he 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 he, he seems to we seem to converge. Of course, I cannot speak for Kit Fine, so maybe if he looks at it uh, again and more closely, he will still he will nonetheless disagree. I don't know, but I I tried to I tried to do a little bit better than I did in the book, but it was also difficult for this book because, I, at least for me, because I uh, I was I was working on this by myself, and there was there is no community. There was there really was no one to really talk to. Because Kit Fine is, you know, he's heavily involved in all this grounding stuff, and he's all over the place. He doesn't; he only has a limited, a small bit of time to devote to this um, arbitrary object business. And for the rest, in grounding, there's a big community, lots of people you can talk to and get comments from. But in arbitrary objects, the community was was much, much, much smaller. Maybe, hopefully, it will it will grow a bit. But um, yeah, I. Um, yeah, I think I think it would again it would be would be good if more people would would um, would be interested in that. <clears throat> does it does it help a little bit? So Definitely. so I think I'm 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 not completely satisfied I'm not satisfied with what with what I did in in the book on 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 that chapter. That's the the chapter that I'm least satisfied with, and exactly for the reasons that Kit Fine pointed out in his review in mind. <clears throat> Okay, so I have to say it again. Are there any more questions? Guess there are no more questions. So, okay, thank you, Leon. It was an honor and a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much. Um, th thank you. The uh, thank you. The the honor and the pleasure was was all mine. <laughs>